So now that we've covered sequential streams and parallel streams, it's time to step back and talk about the fork join pool. Under certain circumstances, I probably would have introduced this topic before parallel streams because it really would help under, you'd help to understand the way things work under the hood a bit better with parallel streams. But the, the transformation between a sequential stream and a parallel stream is so easy to do that it felt awkward to not have assignment two be a sequential stream with a little tweak to make it a parallel stream. So that's kind of why I did the things the way I did them. But now that we've covered parallel streams from the programming point of view, we'll take a step back and see how things work sort of under the hood. And you'll also get a chance to learn how fork joint framework behaves, which you need to know for your next assignment. So a little bit of this is recap, but I'll give you a new slant on it. The fork join pool provides high performance, fine grain task execution for data parallelism in Java. So we'll kind of unpack all that stuff and explain it. So high performance means it's going to run fast. Fine grain means we can make things very lightweight and small scale, small grain. And data parallelism means that we're going to be able to run lots of computation, a co similar computation across different data elements. And this computing engine is used by lots of other stuff. So the fork join pool is used by parallel streams. It's used by completable futures. It's actually used by other frameworks that are not even uh, Java per se. So Akka, for example, uses fork join framework. The way it works, we've, we've covered this before, but here's a recap. It works by divide and conquer. And so the way it works, if you want to solve a big problem, you start out by seeing if the problem is small enough. And if it's small enough, you just solve the problem directly using some kind of sequential algorithm. And if the problem is bigger than the minimum, we split the problem up into independent parts. And then we fork new subtasks to solve each part. And then we join those subtasks, and then we compose the result from the results of the subresults. Compose the result from the subresults, which is kind of a mouthful. Um, now, this is you know, very easily written like this. And you'll see in practice that the different examples we'll look at all have a similar look and feel, although it's, it's typically a little bit more subtle than I've shown you here, but not a whole lot more subtle, which is cool. So here's kind of how this looks from a programming point of view, moving away from pseudocode and uh, cool animations that split things in half. So what we're going to do here is start by taking the single data source, the original data source, and splitting it up into subtasks we, by forking. So you're really, really going to fork. And then we're going to end up with a bunch of these subtasks. <clears throat> and every time you um, create a subtask, you will fork it. And what fork does, as we will see, is it will put the task onto a queue, onto the deck actually, and then make it available for running by one of the threads in the fork join pool. <clears throat> and the trick here is that you keep forking as long as the subtask you've got is too big. So once it reaches the smallest size, you stop forking. But up to that point, you keep forking and subdividing things. Once, you've, once you're done forking, or actually really as you're forking, <laughs> as you're forking things off, those things are being put into the worker pool thread. And those subtasks are then run to completion. So once something has been uh, forked, to its small enough element, it will run to completion. And of course, we'll have all these other things that are running at the same time. So any given atomically sized subtask will run sequentially, but the group of them will run in parallel. And obviously, this implementation is done by the fork join framework, the Java execution environment, the operating system, the hardware. You know, There's multiple layers that are collaborating to make this all work. So all these things are running in parallel on the different cores. And once again, you know, the more cores, the better in this environment. And even if you happen to run in an environment with only a single core, it'll still work. And you might even get a little bit of a win if it's an IO bound task. But to be honest with you, using fork join pool on a single core is probably overkill. Probably, not always, but probably overkill. So better off used and reserved for multiple core. Then as 
things complete, and this is a really subtle and weird semantic, it's kind of hard to visualize, so we'll look at it from a couple different points of view, then someone needs to join with the results of the subtasks. So we fork things and then we join them. And join is a method call that's part of the, the fork join task API, and it's used to wait for that subtask to finish running. Um, and to make things even more interesting, when you join with, when you join on a given subtask, because you always join on one subtask, that call to join is actually used to execute other subtasks as well. And this is a little bit hard to get your head around at first, but I'll give you a nice metaphor to explain it shortly. And then as things are joined, we merge the results back together again. So you get the results of each join and you do something with them, append them or accumulate them or something until you've got a final result. So you basically have a tree of joins and you end up ultimately with a final reduced result or a combined result or a merged result or whatever you want to call it. So a lot of that stuff should actually sound very similar to parallel streams and, and that's no accident because parallel streams uses all of this stuff under the hood in order to actually get the work done. <clears throat> now, I've been describing this as if join returned a result. It's also possible for join not to return a result. Join can just return and give no result. And we'll see some examples of that later. So there's two different kinds of joins. One where you get a result back as a result of joining, and one where you just wait for the computation to finish, and then you pick up and keep going. So that's the end of the introduction. I wouldn't be too surprised at this point is if you have a vague idea of what the fork join pool is about, but it's probably still somewhat mystical how it actually works. And that's perfectly understandable and perfectly okay. We'll, we'll get into those details here in just a minute. 